All right, it's 9 a.m. We're going to get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Claire de la Calle, PGY5 at UCSF, and I'll be moderating this session. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you one of our very own, Dr. Alan Schindel, Associate Professor of Urology and Male Reproductive Health here at UCSF. Dr. Schindel is also our Associate Program Director, is a great mentor to all of us residents here at UCSF, and today he's going to talk to us about the pathophysiology and the evaluation of erectile dysfunction. Dr. Schindel, welcome. No, oh, thanks so much, Claire, for the kind introduction. It's a great privilege to be here with you guys speaking on this topic. Uh, I want to put this out there before I get started with the actual talk. You might see a mirror behind me in a sink. I'm actually not in a bathroom. I just have a strange room in my house that has a sink in it. So just in case anyone's worried about me presenting from a bathroom, that's not what's happening. I'm just in a strange room in my house. So again, welcome all. Thanks for joining in. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I do want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end of the session. So So the outline of what I want to discuss, uh, briefly go over some of the physiology of erectile function. Uh, it's good to have this grounding in terms of how things are supposed to work in the natural state because it will help you when you're evaluating a patient to determine what is the right next step and understand how to explain to the patient what's going on so they can better comprehend the type of therapy you're talking about. Aside from just the physiology, I do want to talk a little bit about the evaluation, uh, specifically things that are drawn from the AUA guidelines that were recently published on the management of erectile dysfunction. I'm going to skim over some of the treatment aspects. Ultimately, there's going to be another lecture during this series by another expert on uh, the management of erectile dysfunction. What I really want to emphasize in this session is the physiology and evaluation, but certainly happy to take questions about management if there's time for that at the end of the session. So when we get started talking about sexual response, I always like to ground it with what we know about how sexual response happens. You know, what is the normal state? Masters and Johnson and Helen Singer Kaplan in the mid 20th century really kind of conceptualized and organized the way we think about sexual responses. And this applies both to men and women. They conceptualized a period of desire leading to a period of arousal, leading to climax in most cases, and then a resolution phase. And you can think about this as a useful way to categorize defects and problems that occur in sexual response. So you can have a problem at the very beginning in terms of sexual desire and interest. You can have a problem reaching climax, uh, that is to say difficulty reaching the, the peak of sexual excitement and arousal. Erectile dysfunction is probably best conceptualized as a defect of the arousal phase, you know, the process of becoming aroused and the physical responses that go along with that. If there's an impairment of that, the most common manifestation is erectile dysfunction in men, and that's what we're going to talk about today. There's obviously a lot of overlap. Many other sexual problems occur in both men and women, and ED is simply the one that we understand the best, but it's oftentimes comorbid with other conditions that merit evaluation, and I think you've heard about some of those earlier this week. I like to talk about this model. Rosemary Bassan is a very prominent researcher, and she had some issues with the concept of a linear sexual response cycle, in part because many of her female patients did not really feel that it represented their experience of sex. Now, I like this model in some ways as a way to conceptualize how sexual relationships work, again, in terms of what makes people want to have sex, in terms of things that people enjoy about sex. This model kind of represents what it's like to be in a sexual relationship and the different incentives that we have to engage in sexual activity. The limitation of this model is that there really isn't a point for innate sexual desire. And I think that's something that occurs in both men and women, that, you know, this intrinsic visceral desire for sexual interaction with a partner that this model really doesn't encompass very well. I still like to talk about it because in the end, I don't think it's appropriate to call it a quote, female model. I think ultimately it's a model of how people, men, women, other gender people, might engage in sexual relationships. And the relationship is really, again, very essential. I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about biochemistry, a lot about some pharmacology. I don't wanna dismiss the importance of this because this is how we as urologists primarily help people. But the social dynamics, the relationship, the dyad, what's going on with the couple uh, remains something that's really important. And you always want to have that in the back of your mind, at least to bring it up as a topic for consideration and, and make sure the patients are talking to their partner or partners. Uh, you probably aren't surprised. I, I sometimes am still surprised though by the fact that I talk to people, they come and they discuss with me the problem they've been having with erection for five, 10, 20 years in some cases. And I learn from speaking to them, they haven't even talked to their partner about it. They haven't had an honest heart to heart conversation. So I really try to emphasize this model, the importance of communication, this is something that you really have to invoke for patients because oftentimes they won't really bring it up on their own. 
Um, so keep that in mind as I'm going through the rest of these slides as well. So getting into the nitty gritty, uh, we are not your neurologists. Uh, I don't expect you to fully comprehend the neurology because I certainly don't either. But some general principles that have been established about how sexual responses work in the central nervous system, limbic system, doing with memory and emotion, very important, also the hypothalamus. And the brain is sort of the central processing center where all the erotic stimuli, both intrinsic thoughts and visceral things that we observe, things that are coming in from the outside are integrated and trigger sexual responses. In a gross oversimplification, I will say that dopamine and oxytocin tend to be pro-sexual, so drugs that uh, modulate these neurotransmitters or increase their activity tend to have pro-sexual effects. These can be minimized sometimes by things people use, such as opioids, uh, cannabinoids, etc. They can have, in some cases, a suppressive effect on dopamine and oxytocin. Serotonin, again, speaking in very broad overgeneralizations, tends to oppose sexual responses. And the most common example I can give you of that would be people taking SSRI type drugs who experience declines in sexual desire, oftentimes difficulty reaching sexual climax. There are exceptions to this rule, but you can consider that generally speaking, uh, dopaminergic, oxytocinergic drugs are pro-sexual, serotonergic drugs, not so much. So the brain, as again, as, your, as urologist, it's not really an area we deal with very much. I just want to put some general principles out there. What is probably more relevant to us is an understanding of the spinal cord, in part because spinal cord injury is so common and so important uh, in evaluating patients with erectile dysfunction. Generally speaking, sympathetic tone opposes erection responses. This is mediated by fibers that come from the T11 through L2 uh, nerve roots. Parasympathetic system uh, generally enhances blood flow, S2 through S4, you can see on this diagram here, derived from a book from the early to, uh, 21st century. Again, some more details, once again, moving into the terrain that we as urologists are likely to encounter. Uh, the hypogastric nerve, which is the primary sympathetic innervation to the penis, coalesces in the pelvic ganglion, and the hypogastric plexus to form the cavernous nerve. The pelvic ganglion, uh, is medial to the internal iliac artery, so it's close to where we are oftentimes are working uh, when we do pelvic surgery. The pudendal nerve is the primary uh, nerve root that supplies the parasympathetic innervation to the penis, and this is again the part that derives erection responses in opposition. It also has a sensory afferent, so it carries penile sensation, which can be important for triggering a reflex erection, that is to say an erection that occurs in response to tactile stimulation of the penis. It's also important for the uh, pinnacle of erection response, uh, during which there is contraction of the ischiocavernous and bulbospongiosus muscles. These are the muscles that are responsible for forcing additional blood into the penis, including the corpus spongiosum. And this is a uh, critical part at maximal arousal, usually immediately before orgasm, that has to do with the ejaculation reflexes. So the implications of this, again, very relevant to the spinal cord injured population. Uh, if you think about people who have acute spinal cord injury, uh, typically at the level it happens, they have disruption of the sympathetic uh, nervous system. And the way that's relevant, and the why it's relevant to people developing priapism afterward, is that the brain is responsible for inhibiting sympathetic nervous responses. This is really what drives psychogenic erection function, is the brain uh, centers suppressing the sympathetic nervous system and thereby sort of taking the brakes off erection responses, basically releasing the sympathetic tone that keeps the penis in a flaccid state at baseline. So acutely after spinal cord injury, many people will have a sort of non-ischemic semi-erection, a form of priapism that will typically resolve. Longer term, there can be some predictable patterns to the erectile dysfunction people develop. So people who have a spinal cord injury below T12, again, one that impacts upon the sacral nerve roots, the parasympathetic innervation, will typically not have reflex erections. You can stimulate the penis, you probably not get very much of an erection response. You can, however, or that patient can, however, experience psychogenic arousal. They can experience something that's erotic, that turns them on, and their central nervous system is still intact and able to send messages that basically shut down the sympathetic tone to the penis and thereby take the brakes off, allow for erection responses, at least a partial erection response to occur. Conversely, patients who have upper spinal cord injuries that ability to block the sympathetic tone, you know, basically this, the, the brain inhibiting sympathetic tone from the T11 through L2 nerve roots, that ability is abolished, so they can't necessarily attain psychogenic erections, but sometimes in these cases, these patients are still able to achieve erections from stimulation, you know, touching of the penis, 
that carries along the pudendal nerve and goes to the sacral uh, nerve roots that allows uh, the parasympathetic tone to take over. So some important clinical implications based on neuroanatomy. Testosterone, again, I will briefly mention here, it's worthy of probably at least two or three lectures all of its own, but it's important to recognize it has very important roles to play, both in terms of sexual appetite and to some extent in terms of arousal responses and maintenance of corporal integrity. In terms of how we can influence it, there are data suggesting, which I'll get into later, that testosterone can be beneficial for the patient with erectile dysfunction, presuming they have a low serum testosterone level. But the primary effect of supplemental testosterone in terms of sexual function appears to be relating to libido. And that's where you potentially have the most benefit from testosterone supplementation in appropriately selected patients. Again, that's outside the context of this presentation, but worthy of another talk at a different time. You've all probably seen uh, this diagram. It really highlights that nitric oxide uh, is really the principal uh, mover and shaker, so to speak, in terms of triggering erection responses. And nitric oxide is released from both the neurons, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, and also the endothelium, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. These two uh, isoforms are responsible in nitric oxide's case for triggering the erection response. Then due to shear forces in the endothelial vessels, uh, ENOS is triggered and tends to potentiate and continue erection responses. And it's important to us because not only is this the primary way that erections happen to our best understanding, intervening upon this path with selective inhibitors of phosphodiesterase type 5 is the mainstay of how we treat erectile dysfunction in the modern era. Now, even though that's the mainstay of our treatment, it's worth recalling that there are other physiological pathways at work uh, that are important to how patients are able to achieve erections and also potentially targets for future intervention. Uh, one of these examples being acetylcholine, Again, getting at the notion of inhibiting the sympathetic tone, to some extent taking the brakes off versus putting a pedal on the gas. And also prostaglandin, which as you're aware, we use clinically uh, in the case of erectile dysfunction as an injection agent, which activates cyclic AMP. And you can again see from the diagram here that both cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP trigger a downstream cascade of effects, the principal uh, end result of which is to decrease intracellular calcium. And like any other muscle system, that decrease in intracellular calcium is really what drives uh, muscle relaxation. So some other pathways, again, interesting to know about, important for you know, how we can understand how erection occurs. As I said earlier, decreasing intracellular calcium in general will help engender smooth muscle relaxation. So the more calcium you have, the tighter the muscle will get due to action on the actin, myosin, and cross bridges. So intracellular calcium is very relevant and a pathway uh, that's highly relevant and very interesting to sexual medicine practitioners is that of the Rho kinase, uh, Rho, Rho kinase inhibitors. And again, I always have to have the diagram here to help me remember how this works, but it's a somewhat complicated pathway in which Rho is responsible for inhibiting the action of myosin light chain phosphatase, which is in turn responsible for making the uh, machinery of the actin myosin complex relax. So the concept of a drug that would inhibit this process, basically inhibit the inhibitor, is something that we're interested in. And again, if you've, if you've read the sexual medicine literature at all, you know there's been some interest for some time in modulation of this pathway as a way to treat erectile dysfunction. Unfortunately, there are no commercially viable drugs right now uh, that impact upon this pathway, but it remains a topic of great interest and research. The other important thing to know is that the corpora cavernosa, you know, the muscles of the uh, erectile bodies of the penis is basically a syncytium relating to the presence of these connexin 43 gap junctions between cells. So basically that allows a kind of a synergistic, uh, you know, coordinated response in terms of vasodilation or constriction for that matter that helps the erection response uh, that occurs in one part of the penis spread throughout and permit really kind of a seamless uh, fluid uh, attainment of erections under proper stimulation. So penile anatomy, again, we can go over this relatively briefly. Remember the part of the penis that you can see from the outside is only a, a segment of it. Uh, the penile crus on both sides, both left and right, attaches to the pubic ramus. This is how the penis is anchored to the corporal, uh, to the pelvis. And the tunic albuginea is the sheath that encompasses uh, the spongy erectile tissue that causes penile erection. Uh, the inner layer is basically circular fibers, the outer is longitudinal, and there is sort of a network of oblique fibers between the two layers. And this, this uh, framework is very important, uh, in part because it's how the veno-occlusive mechanism of erection works, which we'll go into in a couple slides. Uh, 
The thinnest area, again, uh, something that's clinically relevant uh, to the tunica is the ventral portion. That's why when you see patients with penile fracture, the most common location for that would be on the thin ventral surface of the corpora cavernosa. It's also important to recognize the corpus spongiosum, uh, the part of the penis that encompasses the urethra and is contiguous with the glands penis has a much thinner corpora, uh, thinner tunica. And that thin tunica is why during arousal and during erections, the penile shaft typically becomes hard and only with maximal arousal does the spongiosum and the uh, glands penis become rigid in part because the, the thinner tunica cannot simply compress and cannot veno occlude as well as the corpora cavernosa of the penis. So getting into the arteries here, again, the ones that are relevant, the arterial blood flow is derived primarily through this pathway you see right here. The common penile artery has three branches which coalesce distally around the glands to produce uh, a vascular ring. And the, uh, the artery that is most relevant to uh, erection response is the cavernous artery. Uh, basically supplies blood to both corpora cavernosa and is responsible for giving off helicine branches that fill in the corporal spaces. An interesting anatomical variant is that some men, 30% uh, or so, have some contribution uh, to the common penile artery from an, an additional accessory artery. And in 15% of men, that accessory uh, uh, common penile artery may in fact be the primary blood source. It's important to know in pelvic surgery because an injury to that uh, artery could be very impactful and lead to very significant erectile dysfunction in men who are primarily reliant on sort of an aberrant or alternative means of uh, penile circulation. The venous drainage, again, very important. Uh, the venous drainage basically is a complex that goes from the emissary veins, which derive from the corpora cavernosa, and go through the tunica albuginea. And as those emissary veins pass between the layers of the tunica, you have uh, compression. As, as the corporal space expands, those veins are compressed, and that's basically the veno-occlusive mechanism of erectile dysfunction. So this architecture of the veins going through that layer is very essential to normal erection function, and any disruption of that is going to be a pretty big risk factor for a venous leak erectile dysfunction, where the blood simply doesn't get trapped on the inside. Penile erection, again, has been consistently divided into four phases. The first is kind of the baseline, uh, flaccidity, uh, very minimal blood flow. There's a filling phase with increased flow and then a full erection during which the corporal bodies are maximally rigid. The rigid erection phase, again, is something that's typically only observed during peak arousal, usually immediately before orgasm uh, in men uh, over the age of 30 or so. And that involves contraction of the bulbous spongiosis and ischial cavernous muscles to force additional blood. You know, basically blood from the pelvis is forced into the corpora cavernosa and corpus spongiosum, leading in most cases to suprasystolic uh, pressures inside the penis that can lead to you know, maximal rigidity. In some cases, even uh, retrograde flow, where the pressure in the penis exceeds systolic blood pressure, you can actually have blood flowing retrograde through the cavernous arteries uh, during maximal penile erection. So having gone over that in, in some level of, of relatively brief table, let's talk more about erectile dysfunction. Uh, erectile dysfunction is the preferred term. You will still see impotence used quite commonly in many contexts. I would posit that that is a pejorative and antiquated term. Uh, I really don't like it and I try to avoid it and try to correct it whenever I come across it because I think ultimately impotence has very negative connotations uh, for what should be again a medical disorder that we want to help people with. It is defined, as you see here, an ability to attain and or maintain an erection sufficient for satisfying sexual activity. And you can see how from the direct, how the way the definition is constructed, there are multiple components. And it leaves a lot of discretion up to the, the patient to determine is this or is this not a clinically relevant problem? Because some men may be able to compensate or may be less bothered by a decline in tumescence. It's, it's very much a subjective and values-based judgment in terms of, you know, what a man wants to do and how bad the condition is. The prevalence is very high. It tends to increase with age. Uh, and also it depends in part on how you ask the question. You'll come across many historical data looking at you know, survey-based studies uh, where the people are asked a single question, have you had problems with erections? Yes, no. And you'll find the prevalence of ED tends to be quite high in those because it's very common for men to have at least occasional, you know, maybe once a year or less, or you know, some frequency of difficulty achieving erections. And certainly one could answer a question, have you had problems with erections? Yes, even if it's been a one-time thing over a period of five years. So more nuanced studies, looking at you know, more detailed questions about clinical bother and chronicity of the problem, 
tend to put the prevalence lower, but it remains very high. You know, it remains something that you will still see uh, quite a bit in your practice. And as urologists, a lot of what we have to do, the things we do to patients, will tend to contribute to erection problems that we need to address up front with them to maximize patient satisfaction. It's important for us as medical practitioners, and an argument we can make to our colleagues in primary care is that ED is the canary in the coal mine. Many of you have probably heard that, that phrase before, but basically vascular disease affecting the small arteries of the penis may be the first warning sign. Uh, you might see vascular effects in the small you know, cavernous arteries many years before you start to see the effects in the coronary arteries or the carotid arteries. So really it's something that should be screened for because it's important. It's important to patients, it should be important to us, but more than that, it should be important as a public health issue because it is something that tells us this patient should be on alert and they are at risk of having uh, vascular complications and even increased mortality down the road. So the AUA, as I said, came out in 2018 with a series of guidelines about how to evaluate the patient with erectile dysfunction. Uh, you can see them listed out here and I won't read them to you, but basically it's the same thing you would do for any patient presenting for any kind of complaint. You ask about the chronicity, you ask about the things that go as part of it, and a focused physical examination is usually recommended. We do believe, based on what I said in the last slide, that it's worth inquiring about the risk factors that a patient is carrying. Again, we don't necessarily spend as much time talking to patients about healthy lifestyles as perhaps we should, but it's important to note that these things, unhealthy diets, sedentary lifestyle, tobacco use, stress, these are all risk factors for erectile dysfunction, and many patients are unaware of that. We are not, as I said, primarily vascular doctors, but a lot of what we do uh, can have overlap and can have massive ramifications for the patient's overall health if we are able to kind of convince them and, and make them aware of how these unhealthy lifestyle things might be contributing to their problems and maybe help them make positive lifestyle changes. I have a great slide I want to share with you later about that. So the history and physical examination, again, it's a sensitive topic. Even as urologists, we sometimes struggle with broaching the topic. Uh, certainly, if it's not something that's being done in the context of a sexual health visit, what I have in my practice, uh, it can be hard to bring up the topic if you're there to primarily talk about prostate cancer or stone disease or what have you. It can be useful, and many people rely on this using validated scales like the SHIM to help break the ice, to let the patient you know, fill out a form that says, hey, there's a problem I want to talk about, but I don't really want to say it out loud. That can be very useful. Uh, and in general, the things you've learned as medical students and residents about open-ended inquiry and normalizing statements are, are often very beneficial in this context. I also like to level set. You know, many patients come in with reasonable expectations. Some do not, and some expect to be 18 for the rest of their lives and, and don't realize that ultimately erection function tends to be something that declines over time. A lot of people understand very little about sex. They don't really know how it works. They have unreasonable expectations based on exposure to explicit media or what they've heard in locker rooms or on chat rooms about what's normal and what's not. So ultimately, Again, with the limited time we have, it's very valuable to provide education or at a minimum direct patients towards, you know, credible information sources. And I can certainly provide some of those for you at the end of the talk if you're interested. But making patients aware of what's normal and what's not can be a big part of what we do and can make a pretty big difference for them, even uh, short of the pharmacotherapies and other interventions we might offer them. So education is a big deal. I like to conceptualize erectile dysfunction into five major categories, and when I have conversations with patients, I try to categorize it this way for them as well, grouping it into neurological, vascular, hormonal, medication-induced, and psychological relationship-based uh, issues that might contribute. And some specific examples of this you can see listed right here. This probably isn't a surprise to any of you, but I, I'd like to go through it again, and something that I'll commonly say, whatever's bad for your heart is bad for your penis. That's one of my, my stock phrases. And it really illustrates how all these different conditions, such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, et cetera, can be major problems in terms of uh, uh, what's gonna be uh, leading to erection problems in men. Uh, hormonal causes, hypogonadism, low testosterone, something patients know quite a bit about and will ask quite a bit about, uh, certainly something that uh, will come up in the conversation and you need to be ready to deal with it. And medications, you know, specifically uh, antihypertensives, beta blockers and thiazines, SSRIs, any kind of hormone blockade, such as with testosterone, et cetera, uh, for a testosterone ablation from prostate cancer treatments. These are common bad actors. 
and the psychological aspect to it. I, I really highlight that. And, and what I tell patients who are oftentimes resistant to the idea, you know, they don't want me to say it's in their head. They say, oh, no, there's something psychological about this. I, I recommend to them ultimately that, you know, every sexual issue, every sexual problem that has ever been had by any human being anywhere in the world at any time has a psychological element. Maybe not as the initial inciting factor, but the response that we as humans have to that, you know, the stress that we feel if there's an issue with sexual life is very real. And that stress is going to manifest itself by activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And that's just the way the human body works. It's not saying that someone's crazy or that, you know, they're making it up or they have a bad relationship even. It's just saying that ultimately we are human beings and our nervous system sometimes acts in ways that are counterproductive to what we want. And the psychological aspects of sex can become a vicious cycle because the more stressed someone becomes, the more someone worries about their sexual performance, the more sympathetic tone they have. It again, as I said, becomes a vicious cycle in some cases. And I've found in my experience talking to patients as I said, many are resistant to the notion that psychology is a part of their problem. When I put it in those terms, when I say that this is not psychology, it's physiology, it's your, neuro, your nervous system. When I put it in those terms, most patients are pretty accepting. And they're like, you know what, I get that now. And maybe I can think more about how I'm reacting to this and, and not just focus on getting a pill and being out the door. So something to keep in mind. So specific vascular risk factors for erectile dysfunction, they're listed out right here. Again, I won't belabor them, but again, as I said, whatever's bad for the heart is bad for the penis. So ultimately, working on these different conditions can make a big difference to patients uh, and can be quite beneficial to them, both for their longevity and for their immediate sexual health. Uh, you'll find sometimes referrals from primary care doctors or cardiologists who say, you know what, uh, this patient, I just, I'm worried they're going to have a heart attack if I give them something. Uh, I, don't really, I don't really want to do it. What are the options? And is there something other than a, a pill that they can use because the pill is going to give them a heart attack or make them blind or deaf or some other such thing. I'll tell you that, you know, we've had PDE5 inhibitors now for 21 and a half years. And the track record has been excellent. Yes, there have been problems. There have been complications. There are rare, serious side effects. But ultimately, these treatments are very safe. Uh, and the risk of interactions, you know, drug interactions is pretty minimal, with the exception being of nitrates, which should be you know, strictly avoided before treating with PD-5 inhibitors. I'll also say that, in general, sexual activity uh, is not necessarily a major cardiac risk factor. Now, I have a slide that, uh, the next part of this slide, I'll talk more about that specifically. But the exertion involved in sexual activity uh, is approximately equivalent to three metabolic equivalents. Uh, that's typically in older or long-term couples, which is the bulk of the patients you'll be seeing, about equivalent to walking. So exertion during sexual activity tends to be not super high, especially in older couples, and it tends to be uh, brief enough in duration that it doesn't pose a major impediment on itself. Now, there are some interesting data, and counter to what I just said, there is an interesting study that was done in 2011 looking at the incidence of sexual activity and as a predictor of major adverse cardiac events. And there was a statistically significant increase in the rate of cardiac events in patients engaged in, in sexual activity. Specifically, per one hour of sexual activity during a week, there was a two to three uh, MI increase per 10,000 person years. Now, putting this in context, that's an hour of sexual activity per week, which again, depending on certain situational factors, most patients are not having an hour of sexual activity a week. So this number needs to probably be adjusted even further down to reflect the reality of what sex looks like, uh, especially in older persons. And there was a benefit that the risk of uh, sexual activity precipitating a, a vascular event was much lower in the patients who were habitually physically active. So people who are active, who are fit, who exercise, who garden, who do things that involve you know, getting their heart rate up, are protected to some extent from this risk. So it's once again, aside from just preserving erection function, engaging in activity, uh, physical activity can be protective against acute events during uh, sexual activity. So it's another reason to really emphasize the, the need for physical activity as we get older. The Princeton three criteria, again, just something you should be familiar with. These are kind of stratified rules for who should and should not be treated for sexual dysfunction. And again, there are three major risk categories right here. Uh, you can take a look at these and see the different uh, profiles. And they're not really that controversial or surprising. You know, obviously you wouldn't necessarily want to treat a patient with uncontrolled hypertension or unstable angina or an unstable arrhythmia uh, 
sex probably shouldn't be at the top of their list of priorities, whereas the patient with, you know, simple control of hypertension, no worries, go ahead and treat that patient. It's the intermediate risk group, the ones where there's same ambiguity, where some evaluation makes sense. And this is a recommendation that you can tell your primary care colleagues about, that the indeterminate men, or if there's any concerns, you know, a simple stress test can be pretty informative. It can help triage whether or not a patient needs to be further evaluated by a cardiologist, or whether they can be prescribed ED therapy, you know, without any further evaluation beyond the patient. So it's a good thing to know about, and certainly I recommend that uh, article, uh, the citation down there, if you have time to, to review it. So as I said, and as, as I hope I've conveyed, uh, lifestyle change can be very powerful, and it's difficult. Patients have a hard time adhering to it, and it's certainly not an easy intervention, but in terms of actual costs and in terms of actual benefits, it's a very favorable thing. I say that in large part because a study that's gotten kind of old now, but Esposito out of Italy in 2009 randomized a series of men with metabolic syndrome to intensive lifestyle change versus kind of the standard device. And what they found at the end of a two-year study was that the met pre prevalence of men who had no erectile dysfunction, basically normal function, improved the intensive lifestyle arm. And in both arms of the study, both the lifestyle group and the control group, the more of these endpoints that we're able to obtain, weight loss, decreased uh, saturated fat intake, more exercise, more fiber, the more endpoints each patient was able to attain, the greater the likelihood they had of restoring normal erection function. So as I said, it's very difficult to do this uh, for patients. You know, adhering to a healthy lifestyle is, is challenging for any of us. But I tell people that there is certainly evidence that it's good for you, and it can certainly make a difference. And I feel very strongly about recommending that at least as part of the overall management strategy for a patient with erectile dysfunction, that they really should think about their lifestyle and what they can maybe change. Not only is that gonna help their sexual function, it's probably gonna help them live longer and better. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that advice. I've also talked a little bit about, you know, the psychological aspects of sex. This is actually me uh, quite some time, I had a lot more hair back then, but this was me. I had the great privilege of meeting Virginia Johnson uh, of Masters and Johnson fame. Uh, and I had a chance to talk to her, and I really respect the work that she and William Masters did. They weren't entirely correct in the assumption that sex was mostly psychological, but I agree with him 100% that sex, psychology is always a part of it. And the sympathetic nervous system activation that goes along with stress is part of why psychology is very relevant to sexual dysfunction. And I really strongly believe that there's an element of psychology in every, sex, uh, every sexual issue. And I'm a big fan of sex therapy. Uh, it's expensive, it's not hard, it's not easy to access, uh, and it's sometimes not necessary. But I seldom think it's negative to have a qualified sex expert, a uh, mental health expert who has special interest in sexuality, talk to the patient and or his partner, and, and really kind of get a sense of where things are at. Because it's not only useful for, you know, managing problems, but also for enhancing communication, you know, developing mitigation strategies. I think it's a really useful thing to do. And this is kind of highlighted, the, the AUA guideline actually, you know, did put it out there that mental health evaluation makes a lot of sense for some of the reasons that we've just laid out right here in terms of, uh, you know, why it's effective, how it works, how you can help people rebuild confidence, and the specific things that a mental health expert might do uh, as an adjunct to medical therapy or just as monotherapy itself are, are listed right here. So the educational aspect. And as I mentioned, I like the idea of we as urologists providing education, but I'm also cognizant of our time restraints. You know, we don't really have an hour to talk to patients about these things, whereas a sex therapist does, and that's kind of what they do. So they're really well suited to help us in that regard. So there are a number of validated scales. Again, I imagine you're all probably familiar with the IIEF, uh, erectile function domain, the SHIM, which is the more commonly used version of that. There is the erection hardness scale uh, and also the sexual encounter profile. And I want to highlight these last three because they are the ones that you're most likely to encounter uh, both in clinical practice and when you see published studies. So the SHIM, as, a, as I said, derived from the International Index of Erectile Function, which is a larger instrument. The SHIM is a nice tool because it's concise, it's easy to use, it's easy to interpret, and it's been validated and used in innumerable studies. It helps you classify ED severity which is relevant because ultimately there are data here from Ray Rosen uh, indicating that the degree of improvement you need to see for the patient to really be noticing it varies. So a patient with mild erectile dysfunction, that is to say, eh, not as hard as it used to be, sometimes I lose it before I can climax, 
that patient doesn't necessarily need a, a huge change in their erection function to feel that they've realized benefit. Whereas the patient who gets very unreliable erections, you know, the severe ED patient is gonna need much more improvement. And it's important when you look at data, uh, especially relating to PDE5 inhibitors or testosterone supplementation, that these minimally important clinical, minimally clinically important differences are quite relevant and they do change based on where a man's starting at in terms of his ED severity. The erection hardness score, uh, this is actually a, a flyer I got when I was visiting China. And you can see basically a four point ordinal scale right here, uh, ranging from soft tofu to cucumber. And again, so this is grades one, two, three, four. Uh, in terms of erection hardness, grades three and four are deemed sufficient for sexual activity, whereas grades one and two are not. I think it's a sim a certainly a simpler scale, and it helps people really understand ultimately, is the erection good enough for sex or not, which is ultimately what patients tend generally care about, more so than esoteric changes in numbers. Uh, not as nuanced, but something that I find useful in clinical practice. And also the sexual encounter profile, uh, questions two and three from this uh, five item scale are simple yes, no questions, which again, get down to the fundamentals. You know, is the patient able or unable to have sex, which for clinical purposes is oftentimes all you really need to know, uh, more so than a quantitative uh, shim score. So the AUA guidelines do recommend that testosterone be checked in the patient presenting for erectile dysfunction. Uh, it is complex and it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, the data we have do indicate that if you look at hypogonadal men, uh, if you give supplemental testosterone, there is an improvement in erection function, at least in aggregate, in terms of overall uh, SHIM or IIEF scores improving. But you'll see that the mean benefit uh, is marginal. And this is probably related to some extent based on the type of studies that are included and the type of patients that were enrolled. But ultimately, it's a relatively modest change in the score. And remember, this, this kind of modest change might matter for the mild ED patient, probably not gonna be enough to help the severe ED patient. So I don't see testosterone as a particularly useful treatment, at least if ED treatment is the primary endpoint or primary goal of, of therapy, I don't generally find that testosterone is gonna be that useful for the severe ED patient, unless they have concomitant low sexual desire and or other symptoms of low testosterone, which again are beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, there is evidence uh, that Testosterone can be useful synergistically with PDE5 inhibitors. Uh, a study done by Jacques Bouvat here looking at men who were verified to have low to lower normal testosterone found that in aggregate, if you looked at all of them, there was really no difference uh, in, when she, in terms of response to PDE5 inhibitors if you give testosterone. But if you did a subset analysis looking at those men who had a value of less than 300 nanograms per deciliter, that group of men, when given supplemental testosterone, did realize a significant improvement in terms of their response to PDE5 inhibitors. So therefore, for the hypogonadal patient with verified low biochemical levels, NED, you might find that the response to PDE5 inhibitors improves uh, by giving testosterone. You'll find resistance from this. And again, when I, when I talk to internists, they come back to this study, which on its surface is, is highly relevant. It's looking at, it's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial of men with biochemically low testosterone, started on sildenafil and then given uh, testosterone supplementation and then followed appropriately in terms of optimizing their levels. They concluded at 14 weeks, however, that there was no difference in any kind of sexual uh, function endpoint. Now, the problems with this study, number one, they looked at biochemical T levels, but they did not assess bother. They did not assess any kind of other metric that is relevant to uh, the, the diagnosis of hypogonadism and low testosterone. And as you see from the run-in period, uh, during the time they were on sildenafil run-in, the mean testosterone level increased. So these men were really not even in the hypogonadal range once they started testosterone anymore. So when I point this out, if and when it's happened, where internists challenge me about testosterone, I'll turn back to you know, a detailed analysis of this study. And, and oftentimes that kind of quiets them down a little bit and convinces them that maybe it's not so simple as this study. There is a place for specialized testing. Now, again, my personal practice, I do adhere to the AUA guidelines and as much as I can by getting serum testosterone on everybody. I also generally like to have general serum studies. So check lipids, check hemoglobin A1C, check thyroid stimulating hormone. Typically by the time they come to see me, they've already had that done by a primary care provider, but if they haven't, certainly in the case of a young man who hasn't even seen another doctor who just comes to see me 
I will routinely want to check those labs to see where they stand and see if there's some occult cause that could be maybe not immediately a problem, but certainly a problem going down the road for this anti-erection function. The optional things, again, there's some very specialized esoteric erection function testing that was done primarily in the 80s and 90s. It doesn't really have a whole lot of clinical relevance now. What is clinically relevant though is color duplex Doppler, at least clinically relevant in some contexts. So I want to spend some time talking about what it is and what it's good for, and also some things that maybe it's not so good for. So before we get started on that, and just for review purposes, there are different kinds of Doppler. You hear different terms thrown around like Doppler, duplex, color flow, power mode, etc. I mean, the bottom line is that there's spectral Doppler, which is basically measurement of flow and velocity and direction. There's color Doppler, which is the you know, visual uh, presentation of that. And then there's duplex, which is again, the kind that we typically use for assessment of erection function. And that includes both color flow and a spectral mode. So you can actually quantify not only the direction of flow, but also the speed. And we use those quantitative endpoints to stratify and kind of classify uh, erection uh, function and, and, and get information about the vascular status of the penis. Is it a useful test? That's where some of the controversy comes in. I, I would say that the vast majority of us recognize that it is the probably the gold standard in terms of assessing the vascular integrity of the penis. It's very useful for that. Does it ultimately change management in the era of PD-5 inhibitors? Well, this study published last year in the Journal of Sexual Medicine looked at a group of men, it's a relatively small group, but an interesting study nonetheless, and compared the efficacy of color duplex Doppler ultrasound versus a simple trial of uh, uh, injection to see if you know, the response to the injection without the ultrasound was predictive of outcomes in terms of response to sildenafil. And the conclusion from this study, again, relatively small, but the conclusion was that the data you derive from the response to injection uh, was more predictive of improvement, cure, and satisfaction, or failure to do so, than the duplex ultrasound procedure itself. And this is also, again, looking at area under the curve, erection hardness scale. So just a, a subjective assessment of how hard was the penis erection in response to injection was better than all the kind of more complicated esoteric data derived from the ultrasound. So this goes along with the notion that in the modern era of PD-5 inhibitors, uh, color duplex ultrasound is, is interesting, it's academically useful, it can give you information that is somewhat uh, relevant. Does it fundamentally change management uh, in many cases, no. And the, the principal utilization of this, again, is thought to be in, in younger men, you know, younger men who might have psychogenic ED or have had vascular trauma. This is another study, again, even smaller, looking at men who had color duplex ultrasound using uh, the standard technique down at UCLA, uh, where they do quite a lot of these. And what they concluded, you know, from this study in young men was that very few actually had arterial insufficiency or arterial disease on the imaging test. And the conclusion they drew from this was that you're very unlikely to find, barring some form of trauma, such as pelvic fracture or other vascular injury, you're unlikely to find an arterial etiology for an otherwise healthy young man. And you have to conclude in many cases that the problem is venous leak due to either sympathetic tone uh, being excessive or uh, some other factor. And, and it goes along with the notion that many times the patients that we see presenting to us they tell us that the first problem they had, it wasn't that they had trouble getting an erection, they had trouble maintaining it. And again, that kind of goes along with the concept of venous leak uh, erectile dysfunction, where the trouble is maintaining, not attaining. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this study, uh, but I'll conclude here by saying the process of care ED did recommend that color duplex ultrasound can be useful, but only in very select indications, uh, when there's really a reason to think it might change management, or at least give you some context about what you might do differently is not something that has to be routine. Uh, I'll skip over this, but again, just uh, for context and for if you were to see a color duplex ultrasound report, the things you want to make focused on would be the peak systolic velocity, which is a measure of the arterial, uh, arterial inflow, the end diastolic velocity, which is useful for assessing venous leak, and the resistive index, which is again, kind of a, a composite metric of both ESV and EDV, that is again, a, a measure of venous leak. And I'll skip this because again, I apologize, I'm running out of time. I do want to leave time for questions, but there are some subtleties to how the exam is done that uh, are worth talking about. So concluding, it is useful for assessing the vascular integrity. It can be confounded by a number of factors. And it's really something that should be used selectively, if at all, and usually only used in the context of, of people who do quite a lot of them. 
is a nuanced and somewhat complicated procedure. So we know a lot about erections. There's a lot about sex we don't know and a lot about the neurology of this that we don't know, but there's a lot we can do. And if you're familiar with the principles, you can kind of use them to counsel patients to provide the best level of evidence possible to kind of give them what they need and help them reach their goals and their partner's goals. There is a protocol and thankfully now we do have guidelines that have been published on how to broach these topics and how to do the evaluation in a selective and kind of evidence-based fashion. And there is an indication in some cases for specialized testing, but most of what you need to treat the ED patient you will have at your fingertips in a, in a regular general urology setting. And again, the topic of, of how to treat, uh, that'll be again a different, we, we touched on it here, but that'll be a topic for a different presentation. So I do want to emphasize the, the interpersonal relationship things, the variables there and the lifestyle, very important. And I always try to include that in my conversations with patients for their well-being and to kind of optimize overall health. I finished a little faster than I meant to. I did want to leave time for you guys to ask questions. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions right now. Oh. All right, thank you very much Dr. Schindel for a very comprehensive talk. Um, so uh, while we wait for uh, some more of the questions to uh, roll in, uh, I wanted to uh, go ahead and ask you, uh, what has been your experience referring patients to sex therapists for urologists that don't necessarily know of any in their community um, finding one? And, and, and what about insurance? Does, do they ever reimburse these types of visits? It depends on the nature of the consultation. And for sex therapy specifically, I think it's hard to secure reimbursement. You know, the challenge is that in most cases, uh, the, your average, you know, ma family, uh, community and uh, family therapist or social worker, et cetera, they may not be expert in sex and they may not really know how to address the topic and certainly may not make it a, a focus of the conversation. And in California and probably many other states too, anyone can put out a shingle and say, I'm a sex therapist. There isn't really a board or an organization that certifies it at the state level. There are, however, two uh, organizations. One of them is called the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. That's AASECT.org. There's also the Society for Sex Therapy and Research, STAR, S-S-T-A-R.org. Those are two organizations that have a membership that have committed to really the principles of sex therapy and evidence-based practice and a certain level of experience. So I direct my patients, even here in the Bay Area where there are a lot of, uh, quote, sex therapists, I, I will generally direct patients to those websites. And they can use the, uh, the tools on those websites to locate providers who are close to them, who are aligned with them in terms of values and other things that might be important. So those two sites, aascct.org and star.org, are, are where I typically turn to to send patients for sex therapy. Um, and uh, a lot of people are interested in um, your, your discussion on duplex studies and we're wondering if you have any tips or recommendations or maybe resources on how to perform and interpret these duplex studies. Well, I'll tell you on my slide set, I, I apologize that I went over those in, in faster detail than I could, but if we can post them, I'm happy to share the slides I have. I presented them at the Sexual Minute Society meeting uh, last fall. And there's some information there about the subtleties and the challenges and the limitations of this uh, modality. I think ultimately it's something that you probably, if you want to actually do them, you should probably seek out fellowship training where you're going to do quite a few of them uh, and, and know how to do them, know how to handle the intricacies. I would say, let me just back up on my slides here. I can show you the basic, uh, the basic stratification scheme that, are, that is used. Here we go. So there are different ways this is looked at. Uh, this is a study from 1993 where they were really trying to work out, you know, what was normal and what's not. The things that are particularly relevant is that if you look at these data, and these have been somewhat codified, is that if the peak systolic velocity is greater than 30 uh, and the EDV is less than three, resistive index greater than 0.8, that generally is consistent with normal vascular integrity. And you can find this again in the study, uh, Bilu 2015, where they show basically a stratification scheme. And you'll see that there's actually a lot here that are sort of you know, partial or partial or borderline. And again, this is probably the best single slide for answering that question about how to interpret. 
Okay. And great. I'm happy to make this available to you guys if there's some way to do that through the, the lecture series where I can let you review. Again, the slides that I had to kind of skip over due to interest of time. Uh, yeah, someone else asked about um, nocturnal penile tumescence and rigidity measurement using Rigiscan. They were curious on your regarding your thoughts on this. Yeah, Rigiscan, uh, it's sort of an update. In the, in the old days, it was called a posted stamp test, where they actually people would take a roll of posted stamps and wrap it around their penis. And theoretically, the next morning when the patient woke up, if the stamps had broken, it implied that it had an erection overnight. And that would uh, indicate that erection function, nocturnal erections are happening. Rigiscan is sort of uh, a more high-tech way to do that. And basically, for those who don't know, it's basically a cuff that goes around the penis at the base and the tip. And basically, it records over the course of a nighttime the degree of tumescence of the penis, both at the base and the tip. And historically, it's been something that's been used to really gather data on nocturnal erections and whether or not men are having nocturnal erections. And the thinking in the past had always been that, you know, if a man has nocturnal erections but not erections for sexual activity, the implication is that it's psychogenic, that he's got some kind of psychological barrier to uh, sexual response, and, and that's something you need to focus on in that context. It's nonspecific, it's not super sensitive, it's not super specific. I'll say that ultimately that nocturnal erections are a good gauge of basic, you know, function of, of, the, art, of the blood supply to the penis, and they typically don't occur in the case of patients on low with testosterone. Does it change management? Again, I come back to this question. Would you change your management of the patient based on a ridge scan result? And honestly, I'm not sure that I would. You know, I don't think that it's particularly useful. It can be informative. It can be something to talk about with patients but I personally have not seen how it impacts upon my practice and how I treat. Okay. Um, someone asked, uh, so a few questions, what is your approach to the index patient? Uh, when do you consider special tests and real life experiences? And um, how do you interpret borderline duplex studies? Uh, I would say again, this slide that I'm presenting right here kind of goes over, you know, the, the, the metrics that are, again, they're not set in stone, but the organization and the experts who really do a lot of duplex ultrasounds kind of turn to these or numbers like them to conjure up a classification. And again, ultimately, this doesn't tell you why, you know, it could be due to our, you know, atherosclerosis, it could be sympathetic tone, it could be a arterial injury from a, from a car accident or pelvic fracture. It doesn't tell you why it happened, but it does give you some benchmarks in terms of what's normal in terms of vascular studies. Uh, could you remind me the second part of the question aside from just interpretation? Uh, yeah. How to do it? What do, you, how, what do you do with borderline studies? Well, you can repeat them. I would say ultimately it depends what, what's your ultimate goal. I would say it's not uncommon uh, for duplex studies that are done outside of, you know, centers where they do a lot of them, they give a single dose of erectogenic agent, they don't redose, and that's an important part of doing duplex studies is that if a patient has an insufficient direction response, which is not uncommon in the context of, of especially a first time getting a duplex ultrasound, the standard of care is to redose with a second uh, round of, of vasodilating agents, such as prostaglandin E1 or a compounded medicine. So that would be a standard thing that's done. Uh, it should be done routinely. And if, if you get a report from outside, from someone you don't know who's done a duplex but hasn't redosed, you would probably want to repeat the study. Presuming you have, again, let's say you have a patient who is 30 years old, otherwise healthy, had a pelvic fracture, they're a patient who might uh, have a arterial disruption, an arterial injury leading to erectile dysfunction. And in that case, after you did the duplex and confirmed uh, an impairment, either unilateral or bilateral of blood flow, you would consider getting a selective internal pudendal angiogram, so basically a vascular uh, interventional radiology study, to see if there is a stenosis or blockage uh, of the circulation. And that would be the rare patient. And again, they're, they're rare. You don't find many patients like this. The patient who could theoretically benefit from some sort of revascularization procedure and that would be something that would have to be done in the center of excellence. And again, as I said, we don't encounter those very often. But that is the one group of patients in whom the AUA guidelines do recommend that vascular surgery, specifically a bypass surgery, can be contemplated. The more common situation is that you get a patient with evidence of venous leak, you know, so high end diastolic velocity where the blood flow continues and the blood is not staying trapped or a high or a low resistive index. Historically, again, in the 80s, 90s, and maybe even into the early 2000s, uh, crural ligation or venous surgery, basically tying off 
the part of the corporate that was thought to be leaking was touted. And it was done, and I've met some of those patients. Some of them said that it made a great difference for them. Many did not. And ultimately, the current guidelines do recommend that venous surgery for erectile dysfunction is not recommended. Uh, the outcomes were too variable. It's a much more invasive kind of surgery, uh, and the potential for injury to the arterial inflow is, is certainly there. So it's not something that we do very often. You will, again, find some people who are you know, at least exploring it or talking about it. Again, it's something that's way outside the scope of, of general urology practice, and probably out of the scope of most sexual medicine practices too, to be honest with you, because it simply is a much more invasive and nuanced type of procedure. Yeah, and that, um, I guess that also answers the, the next question is when, when to surgically uh, interfere with these bypass surgeries? A, a few people asked about that. Yeah, I mean, rarely. Again, the guidance is that you want a patient, so the, let's, venous surgery, let's just take off the table altogether, at least according to the guidelines. The guidelines currently state there is no patient in whom that's clearly indicated. It may be in a clinical trial that could be considered, but as of right now, it's not recommended. The patient who you would consider where the duplex ultrasound probably has the most benefit would be under the age of 40, no vascular disease, history of pelvic trauma, uh, something that would again tell a compelling story at how they could have had a disruption of the pudendal artery or some other artery along the, the pathway that would be potentially amenable to a bypass. It's not going to work for the generalized vascular paths, people who have pretty poor circulation in the cavernous arteries themselves. Uh, there was an interesting study about 10 years ago looking at stents, you know, basically pudendal artery stents. Unfortunately, there were some interesting, some positive responses, but not enough to really make that something that was followed through upon. So it didn't really catch on. So I would say, typically, uh, the average patient with uh, erectile dysfunction, certainly over the age of 40 or so, is going to be best served with probably an implant. Uh, if, they're, if they're looking at surgery, it's going to be a much more reliable option than any kind of bypass surgery for the vast majority of cases, the exception being the, the index patient I outlined above. Um, someone just asked, when do you start ED treatment post prostatectomy? Uh, that's mostly dependent on the oncologic surgeons. I would say from our perspective, there is no time limit. I would say once they've healed sufficiently that the catheter is out and they're able to engage in normal activities of daily living of which sex is one. I think there's certainly no reason not to. Uh, there is no uh, data indicating to me that treatment with ED drugs consistently or reliably changes outcome. You know, you might come across some older studies looking at the prevalence of PSA recurrence in men treated with uh, so PD-5 inhibitors or some basic science data suggesting a risk of prostate cancer recurrence with that. They're pretty weak and flawed data. And ultimately, I think the absolute risk for anything like that is pretty low. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, and again, that this is something I also put out there, the concept of penile rehabilitation, uh, everyone does it. And we all do it because we want to intervene. We want to make a difference. And, and there are some weak data suggesting that it helps. Again, turning to the AUA guidelines and the guidelines that were derived from three different randomized placebo-controlled studies of penile rehab using PDE5 inhibitors, at the end of all the enrollment periods and the washout periods, there was absolutely no difference in terms of the number of men who recovered spontaneous erection function. Whether they took placebo every day or PD-5 inhibitors every day, it didn't matter. So while I think that penile rehab with PD-5 inhibitors is not harmful, and I think it certainly helps in the short term, it might help people engage in sexual activity while they're on the therapy, and there's no harm from it that we can tell, I really try to caution patients that penile rehab is not necessarily going to save them. It won't necessarily restore erection function the way we might hope or, or more accurately, the way patients might, might want it to. You know, when you tell people about it, they're usually all on board. And what they hear, whether you say it or not, what they hear is that, oh, I'm going to be back to normal in six months or 12 months if I take this drug. And that's simply not reality. They just need to be kind of reminded of that, I think, during the pre-op and, and immediate post-op conversations. Yeah. Um, someone uh, asked if you have a preferred uh, PDE5 um, inhibitor, uh, mm -hmm. any patterns or t patient characteristics that you would choose one versus another? The, they all work by the same fundamental mechanism. I do not have a preferred one, aside from the fact that if their insurance company wants to pay for one and not the others, that's the one I'll go for. The one exception to that, uh, as a general principle, is that people who have sex that's less predictable, you know, who need a longer window of time to engage in sexual activity, might be better served with Tadalafil or even Avanafil, both of which have longer half-lives than 
a sildenafil and vardenafil. The, the spontaneity is nice, both psychologically, in terms of, you know, sex feeling spontaneous and exciting, the way most people refer it to. The honest truth is that the majority of pe people, not just ED patients, but people in general, kind of know when sex is going to happen. Uh, once you're past the initial phases of a relationship, most of the time people kind of know if it's date night or it's the night we usually have sex. They kind of know. So the spontaneity thing becomes less relevant, I think, for most patients. So I don't worry quite as much about, you know, the half-life or the, uh, the benefits of the, of the daily dose to Dalafil option. Uh, people will anecdotally say, I like this drug, I don't like that drug. Uh, this drug is better for me because it works better. This drug works less. Ultimately, that's, that's a very personal decision, and I don't have any strong personal feelings about what they should or should not be on as a first line. I just you know, put them on whatever is easiest and cheapest. Great. Well, um, I think we're all out of time. Um, thank you to all the people that asked questions. And Dr. Schindel, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I just want to remind everybody to go fill out the survey. Um, and then we will see everybody at 1010 for the next lecture. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you.